Hello lovely people, welcome to the Geek Cupboard, I am Penge and it's Sunday night which means more Sunday night story time here in the Geek Cupboard with Tally Ho. So get that cup of tea ready, find a comfy spot to relax in and we shall begin. So a quick recap, last time out all sorts of nonsense went on and it was rather wonderful but it was also very very involved indeed. So here we go, buckle up everybody because there's quite a bit to go through. Firstly, Mopsy volunteered us for a scheme whereby we would take on the identity of infamous sneak thief Light Fingered Lou, complete with a mass and a caution of fake gun and such like and the plan was that we would sneak into Aunt Primrose's neighbour's place they were called the Mud Wasps and then we'd rob everybody while they were all playing Baccarat then we'd run off Rory would then bravely chase after us we'd let him catch us then he gets the money back and he's lauded as the hero whilst we escape into the night we go home and nobody is any the wiser and it sort of worked it sort of worked we did the whole robbery part sort of okay but then as we were fleeing the Mud Wasps house with our ill-gotten gains the real light-fingered Lou appeared in front of us, revealed herself as Hayes, and then stole our stolen goods from us. So we chased after her to get the stolen goods back, we ended up in the grounds, Rory then caught up with us but thought we were the real light-fingered Lou, and there was a bit of a fight going on. He then told us that he loved Cupboard, not realising that we were Cupboard, so Rory essentially admitted his love for us. Then we revealed our identity, we had a bit of a romantic tussle on the ground in front of Aunt Primrose, but I don't think she kind of picked up on the romantic aspects of that, and then we escaped back home, with Rory receiving some some, if not all the praise he needed from Aunt Primrose because yes he chased away the burglar but he didn't get the money back but you know what never mind you know it sort of worked out okay in the end and then just you know add to the whole drama of the night we had to avoid Inspector Ambrose when we got back to the house because we were locked out due to some you know dramatic irony and we had to climb up some ivy to get into our room so all in all it was very involved and now we head into chapter seven which is called the parlor scene so here we go Sunlight plays across your face as the morning bids you a fond welcome to the new day. You keep your eyes closed, resisting the beckoning of the day in favour of just a bit more sleep. You are accustomed to waking up quite early to tend to Rory's needs, and you are certain you must have overslept. You turn over, warm under the comforter, wondering what the day will bring, when you hear breathing very close to your face. You crack open one eye and see the peacock, okay right, I wasn't expecting that, the peacock Sanchi San in bed with you, looking at you with great interest from approximately one inch away. <laughs> Okay, bolting upright, you see Galatea and Orlando on the floor near the bed, pecking at the decorative moulding. Cupboard, calls Rory from his adjoining bedroom. I say, is there a morning paper I could look at? He knocks at the connecting door. I would settle for a croissant. In fact, let's make it two croissants and no paper. Okay, so then we can say, one moment, sir, I'm just getting dressed. There are a large fowl in here, sir, I say. Some help would be appreciated. Or I try to gently lure the birds into a reasonable hiding place. Um... I mean, do we just be honest with him? I mean, there are some large birds in the room with us. I wonder if he could sort of come and help us a little bit, because that would be quite nice. Although, what are we wearing? I imagine we wouldn't have got into any kind of form of pyjamas or whatever. So, are we still wearing our kind of, you know, sneaky, light-fingered Lou disguise? I'm not entirely sure. Um, let's just be honest with him. Let's go, there are large fowl in here, sir, I say. Some help would be appreciated. Uh, it is a bit hard to hear you through this door, Rory says, but it sounded like you said... I did, you say. Can you give me a hand? Rory opens the door and leaps in as if rushing into combat. The peacocks startle at Rory's entrance and dart around him into Rory's room, eager to explore some place new. Good heavens, Rory cries. You were not kidding or exaggerating. I do appreciate your blunt honesty, but why aren't his peacocks in your room? What are you doing with them? Where are my croissants? I don't know which question is more important. I haven't the faintest idea, sir, regarding the peacocks. Rory looks around the room as if a solution might somehow present itself. I like that, just sort of looking around. Do you have any particular instructions regarding these birds, sir? You ask. Rory looks at you with an expression that wavers between, between amusement and confusion before deciding not to worry about it anymore. I'll assume you'll have things taken care of in the avian department. I'll leave it in your capable hands. I will sort the situation out, sir. Good, good. How long did you stay at the Mud Wasps last night? Oh, just an hour or so. Mrs. Mud Wasp took it well enough, as these things go. Aunt Primrose is not at all happy, as you well know. You did the best you could, but alas, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang aft agly, as I've heard you say. <laughs> I don't think we've ever said that. Rory, I think you might have got some things mixed up there. Um, yes, it was a most unfortunate conclusion to the whole affair, you say. Rory nods vigorously. Hold on a moment. He goes to the window and flings it open, taking a deep breath of cool morning air. Bracing, that's the word for it. It makes me long for a vacation. That might be just the thing. What do you say about New York cupboard? 
That's in the United S of A. Their secret is they add the word new to a city and pretend they've very cleverly come up with their own name. What say you, cupboard? We can wear our most stunning outfits and stroll up and see the well-to-do up on Lennox Avenue, putting on the Ritz. Okay, right, so he's inviting us to go to New York, which does sound very exciting. Um, I cannot help noticing some, uh, noting something about the fascinating song you just quoted. Oh, putting on the Ritz, okay. Uh, Miss Signet Signet and you will have a lovely time, I'm sure. Let us set, uh, set off immediately after we return from this trip. I mean, given what happened last night with the whole, you know, sort of embrace on the floor and such like, um, I think we can just go for this. I think we can be relatively sort of honest and open with him now. So let us set off immediately after we return from this trip. Miss Signet Signet can just clear off. It, it's, you know, that's not right anymore. She's not involved anymore. Um, so yeah, let's go afterwards. Um, we should return to our flat and pick up the appropriate clothes. Oh, no, hang on, that's Rory speaking, sorry. We should return to our flat and pick up the appropriate clothes. What are they wearing in New York these days? We'll have to pick up a few style-oriented periodicals en route home, covered. I look forward to it. We'll have to visit my millionaire uncle on the south fork of something called Long Island, who practically gives his money to anyone who offers him a sob story. I haven't visited him in ages, and he'll be so happy to see me that he'll be certain to fork over the cash by the forkful. We'll bring a wheelbarrow, he'll fill it up, and then all shall be ujicum spiff, whatever that means, once I break it off with frankincense, of course. Okay, right, so he's already sort of diving into the whole breaking it off with frankincense thing. Um, I applaud your resolution, but I wonder, I wonder whether you will be able... Dot, dot, dot. Tears of joy well up in my eyes. I kiss Rory. I start making my bed racked with guilt and confusion. <laughs> okay. Okay, I don't think we'd do that. I don't think we'd feel guilty and confused. I don't think that's kind of Cupboard's way. Um, possibly that one, keeping it sort of formal. But I'm sort of thinking, I think maybe kissing him right now might be a little bit. That might be a bit too forward. I think tears of joy can well up in our eyes. Because, you know, this has been a long time coming. We've had to wait a long time for this. And finally, our plan has actually come to fruition. So here we go. Tears of joy well up in our eyes. Are you quite all right, Cupboard? Rory asks. <clears throat> yes, sir. Very much, sir, you say. Good, says Rory, studying you, and then smiling. I'm glad. No tears covered. There is no need. Good morning, Rory, comes Frankincense's voice, sounding quite chirpy. She knocks on Rory's door and starts to turn the knob. Are you in? I've been knocking. My head talking. Your door is ajar, so I thought I would... Frankincense steps in and sees the bird standing on Rory's bed. She puts both her hands to her mouth. Good, good morning, Frankincense, says Rory. I cannot believe that you did this for me, Frankincense says to Rory. Uh, how's that? Rory says. You knew that I longed to have these poor birds free, and you took it upon yourself to free them when everyone else turned away. You are a hero, Rory Wintermint. You risked, indeed still risk, a lengthy prison sentence in order to give me the gift I most desire. Thank you, Rory. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Oh. Oh, wait, what? what? A lengthy prison sentence? That doesn't sound good. Right, this could go badly, couldn't it? This could go all sorts of wrong. Rory, I love you even better than ever. If such a thing is possible, there may have been moments when I doubted your seriousness, your commitment to our joining together as one. But now I realise what I meant to you. Never before, never has anyone made such a gesture for me. I have often felt as if nobody understood me, that I fight the good fight alone. Now I see in you a partner, someone to struggle with, to go through privations with, and if necessary, to face the gallows together in the service of truth and justice. You are one in a million, Rory. My father thought I was insane to choose you. He will have to eat those words. Uh-oh, right, this is all going to go horribly, horribly, painfully wrong. Rory opens his mouth to reply and leaves it open, as if hoping that the correct response <laughs> will fly out of its own accord. I could not be more pleased to be engaged to you, Rory. Ah, okay, right. So what do we do here? So we can either say, uh, in point of fact, I must intercede here. Mr. Winterman did not bring the peacocks in here. The situation is mysterious to us. So we'll burst her bubble with that. But it is the truth. You know, we are not lying there. We don't know how they got there. I, of course, was responsible for bringing the peacocks into the room, not Mr. Winterman. Um, yes, Mr. Winterman accomplished great deeds last night. I personally witnessed his heroism in getting the peacocks here. Or, go on, sir. I believe you said you had something important to say to Miss Signet Signet. Let's not do that, because that's going to put him on the spot and that's just going to make him cross. I think we tell the truth. I think we go down this one, because he didn't bring the peacocks in, and neither did we. We've no idea how the peacocks got there, because they weren't there when we went to sleep. I imagine they've come in through the window. I mean, can a peacock fly? 
I genuinely don't know. I'm not entirely sure. I guess they came in through the window, but um, but yeah, let's just be truthful. Let's actually tell the truth. Uh, that's right, Rory says. While I would love to take credit for this uh, marvellous deed, I cannot. You didn't do it. Is this modesty? I'm afraid not, you say. You may trust me. We were both quite surprised this morning. Oh, frankincense, his face falls. Then I did not misjudge you completely. You are the man that I thought you were. Ah, this is good. This is good, because we've not done anything horrible. We've not said anything horrible here, but we've kind of, you know, we've ruined that moment for her. Okay, this is this is good for us. It's not good for frankincense, but it's quite good for Cupboard and Rory. Um, I wouldn't go that far, Rory says. I thought there were a few points where you might have judged me just a tad harshly. I am very disappointed, frankincense says. Good morning. Good morning, you say. <laughs> oh dear. At precisely this moment, you hear a commotion in the hallway. You peek out of Rory's door and hear Carlington calling in a resonant baritone that all the guests ought to come down to the parlour. This is far from the way Aunt Primrose usually does things, says Rory. Usually, she allots several hours in the morning for lolling about and then a late and large meal. She is not one for rousting? Ro I've heard rousing, never heard of rousting. Rousting her guests out of bed at the crack of... Uh, what time is it covered? Half past nine, sir. You can hear Carlington's voice on the second floor now, knocking on doors and escorting guests outside. I wonder what the unusual urgency is, Rory says. Probably some souffle that must be served at once. The peacocks screech as you depart. We'll be back, you say. Be good, says Rory. Covered after breakfast. We really must put those birds back where they belong. They may have already untidied my bedclothes. Right after breakfast, you say. You lock up the door to the Wintermint GHQ and head downstairs, where a grim-faced footman points you toward the parlour. Mopsy is standing near the door to the parlour, adjusting her hair in the mirror. Aunt Primrose's help is rushing to and fro, looking far busier than typical for this time of day. OK, so Mopsy's there. So we can say, good morning, Mopsy. You were looking rather smart. What's all this commotion about? Asking a servant. Or I turn to Rory, attending to his needs. Let's let's keep up the appearance of being a good, a good gentleman's gentleman. Let's turn to Rory and attend to his needs, because that's what we're there for. That is our job. I am certainly going to need to be braced with a beverage before facing the assembled crowd in the parlour, Rory says, sinking into a chair in the foyer. You produce a steaming cup of tea on a tray. I mean, this is brilliant. It could not be any more perfect. Can we have one as well? Please say that we can have a cup of tea. Um, you produce a steaming cup of tea on a tray, and then we also have one. It's in really small writing there. We also have some tea next to a croissant and a morning paper. I believe this was what you requested, you say. Yes. Rory looks delighted and takes a long draught of the delightfully smoky Lapsang Souchong tea you have presented to him. Rory's favourite. That is a very nice tea. It's a very, very nice tea indeed. I do like a bit of Lapsang Souchong. I haven't had that for absolutely ages. Uh, Mopsy looks at the croissant covetously and Rory breaks off a cousinly corner of it for her and then another. I didn't even see you fetch this cupboard. That was well done. Uh, tish tosh, sir. It is my practice to ensure that your needs are well taken care of. Think nothing of it. It must be very... Oh, hang on, that's Mopsy. It must be very distracting to try to serve Rory when I am here looking so fetching, Mopsy says to you, sounding miffed that you have not praised her yet. There is a certain dazzling effect. Hmm, yes, very nice indeed, Mopsy. <laughs> oh dear, we're annoying lots of people. You and Rory allow yourselves to be herded into the parlour, where frankincense, Hayes... Uh-oh, Hayes is there. We know Hayes' identity, and Hayes knows that we know her identity as well. Um, Colonel Firesnuff and a very flustered-looking Aunt Primrose sit on various chairs and divans. Mopsy follows close behind you and plops down on the piano bench. Colonel Firesnuff is reading the newspaper aloud to nobody and pointing to an article about some gang of delinquent children called the Ragamuffins who live on a nearby river island and appear to eat nothing but bread. <laughs> OK, well, that is why this country needs someone like me in office, he concludes smugly, folding the newspaper and nodding. I think it's terrible, says Frankincense quietly. Valentine, oh Valentine, hi Valentine. Valentine stands with several other servants lined up along the wall. She shifts from foot to foot uncomfortably. Yeah, we've still not got to the bottom of her story, have we? She sort of pops up every so often and she's always a bit uncomfortable. She's not sort of, you know, a proper servant, I don't think. Not quite sure what's happening. Carlington stands at attention next to Regina Wilhelmina, just right of Aunt Primrose. Everyone here then, says Inspector Ambrose. You turn to see him perched on a tall stool, up on a raised dais, day, dais? I don't I never know how you say that word. Platform, we'll call it a platform. Up on a raised platform at the back of the parlour, overlooking everyone else. Two burly police officers flank him. <gasps> oh no, the cops are here. The feds have come to us. Um, why don't you go and search your room? So I've stolen peacocks now that everyone is here. 
Inspector Ambrose says to his police escort. Rory turns to look at you, aghast. Oh, dear. Okay, yes, sir, the officers say, and they start to head for the exit. You simply mustn't allow them to find Galatea, Sanchi San, and Orlando in Rory's room. Yeah, that would be bad. That would be a disaster. Options flash through your mind. You could run out of the room, beating them there, remove the birds, and hide them elsewhere. That would be simple and effective, but surely Inspector Ambrose would notice you exiting and make him rather suspicious. You might quietly mislead the officers, so they find themselves wandering through the East Wing for a while. That would buy some time, but they might realise later that you were being deceitful. Best of all would be for Aunt Primrose to insist that tea be served to the officers. I mean, that sounds wonderful. But that would require you to convince her that social niceties are important, even in a time when her prized peacocks have gone missing, which might be difficult and fluster her further. I think we go for that. I think we might have enough influence around the place. We might be good enough to try and appeal to Aunt Primrose's sense, as it says down here, of gracious hospitality. Because we've kind of been doing that a lot, haven't we? We've been doing the formal kind of things. We've been choosing those options more often than not. So I'd like to think that we're quite good at them. So uh, yes, we'll try to appeal to Aunt Primrose's sense of gracious hospitality. Mrs. Patterson, surely these officers would like a cup of tea before getting to work. Let's go for that one. Perhaps we ought to have tea served, you suggest to Aunt Primrose. These police officers seemed a bit peckish. She turns to you testily, wring a handkerchief in both hands. My prized peacocks, the jewels of my collection, have been stolen, and you come to talk to me about tea? She throws a handkerchief to the ground and gnashes her teeth at you. But surely thought, uh, but, but surely some thought for social niceties. Let me tell you about social niceties. When I find the villain who made off with my birds, I will have them passed thrice through a meat grinder made into a pate and served with hard-cooked eggs and cornichons, which I don't know what they are, but okay, sounds delicious, at a festive picnic for one and all. Does that answer your question? Yes, I believe so. Perhaps I'll just go pop down to the kitchen and help out without disturbing you further. Go, then. I don't care. You run out of the room, heading upstairs, walking past the officers, who are searching Mopsy's room. Okay, so that didn't entirely go according to plan. The officers are still out there, but we've also been able to exit under the pretense of helping out a bit, which is good, because that's our job. Okay, right, so we've kind of got out of there. You open Rory's door and find the three birds sitting in one of Rory's suitcases, no doubt playing some sort of pretend game. I love this. This is completely, utterly farcical and ridiculous, and it's all rather splendid. Perfect, you say. I beg your pardon, this will just be a minor inconvenience. You fasten the suitcase and lift it up. Okay, so we've put three peacocks in a suitcase and now we're moving the suitcase around. Um, it is rather heavy and some squeaks and trills of protest ensue from inside the suitcase as you rush out of the room. You run into the two officers in the hallway. What are you doing with that? One of them says, pointing to the suitcase. I'm making tea, you say. Mrs. Patterson expressly sent me to do so. With a suitcase? Upstairs? Okay, right, how are we going to get out of this? So we can say, yes, it is an invention of my own. I'm always thinking of brilliant inventions. The suitcase is where I keep baked goods. You may rest easy. There is no cause for alarm, gentlemen. I act as this is the most natural thing in the world to be doing. Of course, how do you make tea? These are all really good options. I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I'm very tempted to do this. Just act completely normal. And that will just really sort of, that'll catch them off guard. They'll kind of go, oh, uh, yeah, it's fine. I kind of like the idea of that. I think maybe if we say it's an invention, they might ask us to demonstrate it or, you know, to show them how it works or whatever. Um, baked goods, that's okay. I think we just try this. Let's try this, shall we? Let's just act like this is the most natural thing in the world. We're making tea with a suitcase upstairs. Why not? Well, my missus always makes it, so I can't really say, says one of the officers. Never seen it with a suitcase, though. I like those little jam tarts. Bit early for that, though, says the other. Never too early, opines the first, chuckling, his belly quivering in mirth. Go on, then. We've got work to do. Having successfully been put at ease by thoughts of little jam tarts, you walk past them, downstairs, and out of the door. Oh, we, we got away with it. We completely got away with it. That is brilliant. At first, you think that you will simply return the three birds their pen, but the area is simply crawling with police officers. You cast about wildly, and then you have it. You will simply walk to the old boathouse. It is large enough for the birds to run around in happily, and there will be people in there later today to prepare the rowboat for the Harvest Festival race. They'll find the peacocks and return them safely to Aunt Primrose. Best of all, there don't seem to be any police wandering around in that vicinity, so you amble across the property and to the boathouse, near where the woodland stream comes out onto Aunt Primrose's property. You peek in a window. Nobody there. The rowboat sits proudly against one wall, up on sawhorses, awaiting the race later today. 
All great boats have names, and this boat's name is blazoned proudly across the side. Okay, right, so the boat has got a name, so we can have Choice of Rowboats, It's Keeling Time, Tin Starboard, The Holywood Visionary, Gunwales of Infinity, let's see some more choices, or I shall write in the correct name. Now let's have a look at some more of the ones that are already here. Uh, the Sturdy Steam Punt, a wise, <laughs> a wise Use of Pine, Punt to the River, Life of a Lobster, Oars of Aswick. Uh, more choices? Are there even more? Oh my goodness me. The Eagle's Oar, The Paddle Throne, Ratings War, Flounder Saga, The Sculling, Reef's Gambit. Um, let's write in the correct name, shall we? Let's write in the correct name. The name of Aunt Primrose's boat is as follows. Okay, right. Now we just need to uh, give the boat a name. Let's call it the Big Bearded Bernard. I quite like that. I like the idea of the words the Big Bearded Bernard being sort of, you know, emblazoned across the side of the boat. And maybe a little picture of Bernard with a gigantic beard. Oh, well, you know, a big beard would be appropriate. I like that. I think that's quite good. And, you know, maybe Bernard with his big beard could be one of Aunt Primrose's, you know, staff or something. Maybe he made the boat. And, you know, that's why it's named after him or something. I like that. We should call it the Big Bearded Bernard. Why not? There we go. You look upon the Big Bearded Bernard fondly, <laughs> thinking of the several outings you and Rory have had in it. It used to be a sort of dull grey and cream, without the least attention to beauty. You recall Aunt Primrose asking you last month whether you would assist her by designing the big bearded Bernard's decoration for the race. Traditionally, everyone goes all out in their decorations, and therefore, you decided upon... Okay, now we get to sort out the decor for the big bearded Bernard. This is amazing. An attractive pastel palette well suiting the boat's grace and attractiveness. It doesn't sound overly graceful. It doesn't sound graceful. I mean, if anything, the big bearded Bernard. Yeah, if there was someone called big bearded Bernard, I'd imagine them to be like a lumberjack or something. An image of a brutal barbarian riding a dragon befitting the boat's size and sturdiness. Yeah, that seems to work quite well. A pirate ship motif, no, meant to bolster its cruise morale. I don't like that. I don't think she'd like that. She wouldn't go for a pirate sort of thing. An intellectually challenging abstract painting in stunning shades of red, orange and yellow designed to arouse bursts of energy in the crew. Okay. All right, so these things here are going to presumably have some sort of advantage when we go to the boat race. So this one here might make the boat graceful and attractive so it might win points for attractiveness or it might be graceful so it's less likely to tip over or something that makes it big and sturdy so it's less likely to break um that means the crew are a little bit happier because they have some more morale and this means that they the crew get energy okay i think this i think an image of a brutal barbarian riding a dragon sounds good for the big bearded bernard because you know big bearded bernard the barbarian <laughs> no Big Bearded Bernard the Brutal Barbarian. There we go. Yes, perfect. We'll have that. Absolutely. The boat is painted with an image of a muscular and fur-clad barbarian. A uh, barbarian warrior, sorry. Riding a bright green, fire-breathing, two-headed dragon. The barbarian holds a mighty, ruined broadsword with one hand and a grail made out of diamonds in the other. The grail is topped with purple flames. It sounds amazing. Do you really think that is the appropriate decoration? Asked Aunt Primrose. I don't really know what sort of style is fashionable for rowboats these days. But this one seems rather fringe. Mrs. Patterson, this painting is awesome. As in, the art will awe all assembled. Hmm, if you say so, cupboard. Okay, yes, we do say so. You open the suitcase, letting the disgruntled birds out. They stretch their wings and set about exploring the boathouse. They should be perfectly safe here for the time being. Now you must simply get back to the parlour at once before Inspector Ambrose notices that you are missing. As you turn to go, you hear steps at the door to the boathouse. A goggle-eyed young woman wearing grease-stained clothes enters. You recognise her. It's Glenna, the assistant cook from the estate just across the way. She swings open the door and startles backwards. Oh, she says, seeing the peacocks. And then she says, oh, again. I affect a tough, threatening attitude. You didn't see anything here, Glenna. Not a thing. I greet her warmly. Hello, Glenna. What are you doing here? I hide until she leaves. I don't think we'd do that. We wouldn't do the tough, kind of scary thing. I don't think we've got that in us. I think she'd just laugh at us. Um, do we greet her warmly and try and talk our way out of this and then pretend that we've not seen the peacocks or something? Or do we just hide? Do we just hide until she goes away? I think, I think she might find us. It sounds like she's coming here to do some work or something. So, I mean, she might find us and then that's going to be even more awkward. Let's just confront her. Let's greet her warmly and hopefully we can have a nice chat with her and, you know, be nice in that sort of way. So, hello, Glenna. What are you doing here? 
Uh, hello there, cupboard, she says, voice shaking slightly. Cool, didn't think I'd see you here. Gave me a bit of a fright. Just inspecting the old boat, you say. All is well. Funny about these peacocks, eh? Uh, yeah, I understand they were stolen. I'm glad they were found. Just now. Did you steal them, cupboard? No, not at all. Indeed, they're a shock to me as well to see them here. I'll just go ahead and let Mrs. Patterson know that they've been found. Indeed, if you like, just go ahead and forget you saw anything, right? Should I forget about that suitcase over there? If you would. I will alert Mrs. Patterson about that as well. That's awfully nice of you, cupboard. I'm sure Mrs. Patterson, Mrs. Patterson would please as punch that our birds are safe and sound. But anyhow, I'm here for another reason altogether. Nothing to do with peacocks. Business, you say? What sort of business? She holds out a small folded paper packet. Actually, I may as well give this to you. Miss Mopsy told me that you provided the money for it. Ah, yeah, we gave Mopsy some money, didn't we? And she said she was going to buy us something nice. We gave her quite a chunk of uh, our remaining reddies. You accept the packet and open it. The powerful aroma of pungent spices overcomes you at once. Your eyes start to water and you refold the packet. There should be just about enough for your purposes there. I hope so. My purposes? What is this for? She frowns. Mopsy said you wanted to make me this all-natural herbal enhancement for the rowers to take tomorrow to give them endurance for the race. What exactly is it? I won't say precisely, as it's a family secret, but I will say that it includes umbongo spice, a good deal of capsicum, grated wasabi, and a number of other quasi-legal herbs and rhizomes. Quasi-legal? Custom laws are such pesky things, aren't they? It's all perfectly fine, just don't go around spreading the news that you have them. But Mopsy said you wanted to, so who am I to refuse? Honest work for honest pay. Well, work for pay at any rate. Remember, give each row one of these pellets just for the race, and they'll row like mad. Glenda, this is hardly sporting behaviour. I insist you take these herbs back. I will not be party to this. I accept the herbs from Glenna and keep them for later. I take the herbs, but then discard them. I take the herbs and leave them in the boat after she leaves. Okay, I don't think we'll tell her off, because... You know, we sort of weren't part of this. This is all Mops is doing. So no point telling her off. Um, I think we'll take them. We'll take them and we'll keep them for later. I think if we take them and discard them or take them and put them in the boat, I think the peacocks will probably eat them. And then we'll have these kind of crazy hyperactive peacocks running around the place. So let's just take them and we'll keep them for later. Thank you, Glenna. I will put this to good use. Good. And of course, don't let on where you got them. I'll be in somewhat rather hot water. Had to order these herbs for our kitchen and then pilfer them and cook wasn't looking. They're fairly expensive, which is why I have to charge a premium price. I'm sure you understand. Of course, Glenna. Good day. Good day, cupboard. I'll see you at the festival, I hope. Naturally. Glenna departs and you stow the small paper packet in your pocket for later. You wait a few moments and then, stowing Rory's suitcase behind a bush to retrieve later, you trot back to the house and carefully slip inside the foyer just as Inspector Ambrose pokes his head out of the door of the parlour. Okay, so we just got back in time. Won't you join us? Inspector Ambrose says sweetly, motioning into the parlour with an obsequious bow with a two-handed flourish. Of course, you say. I was just waiting until you felt it was appropriate for uh, appropriate to join you, sorry. Naturally you were, laughs Inspector Ambrose. You would not have been doing anything wrong. I have not the least doubt you were right out here in the foyer. <laughs> he pauses and sniffs the air dramatically. Tell me, cupboard, is that the faintest hint of Mbongo spice I detect? Oh no, I forgot that he was really, really good at observation of everything. Okay, um, we can say, you know, you're right, it is Mbongo Spice. I wonder what's for luncheon today. I really couldn't say I've never heard of Mbongo Spice. It smells more like cinnamon to me. Perhaps someone is baking a pie. Okay, I don't think we should go down the middle route. Let's go for, let's go for that one there. Yeah, I like that one. You know, you're right, it is Mbongo Spice. I wonder what's for luncheon today. Or try and sort of distract you away from us, possibly. He might go for it. Ah, something exotic, no doubt, says Inspector Ambrose, rubbing his hands together with barely repressed glee. But do come in. We could hardly begin without you. He motions into the parlour again, and you find a seat next to Rory. He looks at you with questioning eyes. You give him a subtle non-verbal signal that clearly indicates that the peafowl have been safely stowed away, and he relaxes slightly. Inspector Ambrose sits on his tall stool just in front of the toasty fire and he pulls out his copy of Wilkie Collins' novel The Moonstone. His bookmark is right at the end of the novel. I just have ten more pages to read, he says. You may talk among yourselves while I finish. He absorbs himself in this mystery, following the lines of his finger and making satisfied sounds like ha and so I suspected as he reads. The two burly police officers once again flank him and read over his shoulder. Where is that tea cupboard? Aunt Primrose says, crossing her arms. I thought you went out to bring up the tea ages ago. Did I? You say. Ah, yes, I did. I can't imagine what the delay is. Hmm, what poor service on the part of your kitchen staff. Aunt Primrose frowns deeply. 
We were really looking forward to it, says the first officer to you. I do hope it'll be along soon. I could eat a whole suitcase worth of scones. That is a strange... Uh, that is a strange expression, says Inspector Ambrose mildly. And yet I think I have a sense of why you uttered it. Yes, indeed. But I just want to finish this last bit before commencing in earnest on what is sure to be a most memorable conversation. He looks up at you and smiles. Oh no, is he on to us? Is he on? He can't be on to us. He can't be on to us. Are we about to be completely undone here? I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say, sir. I sit quietly and a bit sceptically, uncertain about the whole affair. It's rather surprising about Mr. Murthwaite there in the last chapter, isn't it? One would not have guessed it. Okay, now he might not have got that far. That might ruin the book for him. So it might make us feel a bit better about ourselves, but he then might get a bit cross with us. Let's just be polite and formal. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. <laughs> of course you are, he says in a jolly manner. What a stellar attitude. You are a model to all. He then busies himself with his book once again. Frankincense walks purposefully over to Rory and perches in a chair at his side. The two of them talk quietly, both of them nodding a good deal. Frankincense applies a handkerchief to her eyes a few times. They shake hands in a decidedly non-romantic but friendly manner. The wedding is absolutely, officially, off, Rory says, with relief spreading across his face. Yes, good job, Rory. Although I don't think you initiated that at all. I think that was all frankincense's choice. This is good news. This is wonderful news. Hayes regards you steadily from across the room. She does not speak, but the import of her gaze is clear. Do not betray me, and I will not betray you. Don't worry, Hayes. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to betray you, because if I say I saw you there... If I say, I know who Lightfinger Lou is, it says, I saw her whilst I was robbing you out in Primrose. That's going to go down quite badly. Inspector Ambrose uh, closes his book and clears his throat. He scans the room slowly from side to side, taking you all in. I'm sure you're all wondering why I've asked you all here today. Yes, indeed, all of you here in the parlour the morning after some terrible crimes have been committed. There was a break-in at the neighbour's house last night, but more importantly, Mrs. Patson's prized peacocks have been stolen. Stolen! from their secure pen. They may be on the black market for exotic birds, even as we speak. Aunt Primrose chokes back, chokes back a sob. <laughs> but who could have done such a thing? Says Inspector Ambrose, a look of mock horror on his face, pressing his palms to his cheeks and making an O of his mouth for a moment. <laughs> He's properly playing the part here, isn't he? He looks down at you from his tall stool. I can now reveal that light-fingered Lou, the sneak thief who has gotten so much notoriety of late, was on the property last night. And in fact, light-fingered Lou robbed the neighbouring residence last evening. Yes, you may well gasp. He rocks back and forth, delighted. At long last, light-fingered Lou has chosen to match wits with me. Light-fingered Lou is in the neighbour's house. And Mrs. Patson's peacocks are gone. It does not take a genius to deduce that light-fingered Lou stole the birds. All the clues point in this direction. He removes his clues notebook and a small envelope labelled evidence from his breast pocket and brandishes them. What are you doing while Inspector Ambrose speaks? Okay, so we are listening attentively, nodding at all the right places, crossing my arms as a clear show of scepticism or nodding comfortingly at Aunt Primrose. I think we just listen. Let's listen attentively, because if we start doing all this other stuff, we might miss things out that he's saying. So we'll just listen. Let's listen and get this right. Cabot understands says Inspector Ambrose, pointing to you. You yield to my unassailable logic. Clever of you. You nod vigorously. This is boring, moans Mopsy. Get on with it. Very well, says Inspector Ambrose. I would first like to reveal that the person who committed this nefarious crime and a number of other assorted wicked deeds is in this room as we speak. Oh, this is brilliant. This is like a proper crime through the thing. And we're all in the parlour, which is amazing. Opera! Consternation! shouts Colonel Firesnuff. No, it can't be, says Mopsy, her curls boinging violently in every direction. Aunt Primrose looks as though she's going to pass out when Inspector Ambrose holds up his hand for silence. I considered everyone carefully, says Inspector Ambrose. Everyone at first appeared to be a suspect with secrets and hidden identities, but in the end there was only one obvious candidate. At first I considered you, Hazel, or you, Colonel Firesnuff, if you will excuse me, or even you, Cabot, but then I realised that you lacked a certain cleverness and methodical nature that light-fingered Lou always has. Oh no. Then he marches over to Valentine. You, he cries. Me, Valentine says, shrinking away from him. Yes, you are light-fingered Lou, Inspector Ambrose says triumphantly. 
but how is that possible? says Carlington, frowning. She seems a rascal, but a famous sneak thief. Let me explain, says Inspector Ambrose. Oh no, it's all going wrong. My theory of the case is as follows. Having been nearly exposed as a liar yesterday by the diligent work of Carlington and Regina Wilhelmina, you were nevertheless allowed to remain on the property with the proviso that you ought not to leave the house. This complication forced you to act more swiftly than you would have liked. Instead of carefully planning, you made a daring raid on the neighbour's house, as well as Mrs. Patson's prized birds, who you stole for a pretty penny, I imagine. You probably thought you would be removed from the house today, so you had to commit your burglaries at once. You've got it all wrong, cries Valentine. And indeed, he is wrong. Everyone starts shouting at once. You feel fairly confident that Valentine is not light-fingered Lou. We know. We know that she's not. Hayes is light-fingered Lou. Um, should you try to argue with Inspector Ambrose? That might possibly help to sow some doubt in his mind. It would be even more effective to destroy the evidence that Inspector Ambrose collected, but if you are caught tampering with it, you could well be next on the chopping block, and it would be quite a feat to steal it in plain view of everybody. Those are not, of course, the only options. Inspector Ambrose seems intent on arresting someone. If you really wanted to, you could just throw a touch more fuel on the fire to ensure that Valentine is arrested instead of, say, you. No, we're, that's, not the, that's not the cupboard way. Cupboard isn't like that. We're not mean and horrible. This is an injustice. I point out some logical flaws and make some keen deductions in order to in order to clear Valentine's name. While everyone is distracted and looking at the window, I try to steal the clues notebook and the evidence envelope and toss them in the fireplace. Surely that's going to go wrong. That's going to go wrong. Or we you know, support him against Valentine. That's no, we're not doing that at all. Let's um, let's do this. Let's try and outwit him because you know, I like to think that Cupboard is quite clever. And we've been observing all this stuff so far. So let's point out logical flaws and make keen deductions. Valentine would never be a sneak thief, you say. Valentine is in training to go into service, a noble profession. The English ladies' maids and gentlemen's gentlemen are the most ethically trained in the world. We would not steal from our employers. That is your argument, says Inspector Ambrose. Have you never heard of the case of the bagman butler? No. Or the strange affair of the house-breaking housekeeper? No, or most famously, the amazing case of the lazy lady's maid who brazenly made off with Lady Maddie's vase. <laughs> wow. Okay, right, that's an exciting case. I solve those cases. I know all too well there are thieves in your profession. Inspector Ambrose, you've done it again, says Aunt Primrose firmly. Thank you for your diligence. No, but it's the wrong person. Inspector Ambrose pats his pockets. I wish I bought my pipe. It will be a good opportunity to puff on it for a moment moodily before speaking my next words. Oh well. Everyone leans forward in anticipation. I would like to present a shocking and astonishing clue. I have come into the possession of travel documents that indicate beyond a shadow of a doubt that Valentine Hartlock is, in fact, an American actress. He pauses to let the impact of this information sink in. An actress, he says again for full effect. Aunt Primrose gasps and Mopsy screams. Furthermore, Valentine Artlock is not a real name. I have learned that a real name is, in fact, Gertie Porpy. <laughs> the room fills with hollers and hubbub. Inspector Ambrose, think of the scandal, says Aunt Primrose firmly. A false identity, a member of the theatrical world in my house. Be reasonable, Inspector. I would never be able to show my face at the lady's charity cake bake. Couldn't you possibly be mistaken? And with that, the police officers take Valentine away, Inspector Ambrose's firm hand on her shoulder. She looks back at you anxiously, a plea for help in her eyes. And then she is gone. OK, I mean, I don't know. I I is she an actress? Is she American actress? And I've got no idea. Everyone shaken by what has just transpired shuffles out of the room to try to re-establish some sense of decorum and normality, except for Carlington and Mopsy. This is most unfortunate, says Carlington. Mrs. Patterson's name will be dragged through the newspaper. What a shame to our household. I would have much preferred to have taken care of this affair among the family without so much publicity attached to it. I do very much wish Inspector Ambrose could have been reasonable. Oh, now Auntie is going to be very irritated, Mopsy says, and that affects me. How is she going to allow me to marry Figs when she's being traduced? Which is a word I've also never seen, but they go traduced. Is that like being sort of slandered or whatever? In the press. Answer that cupboard. Crikey is OK. I do wonder if you'd be willing to make an effort for my sake and for Mrs. Patterson's to try to get Inspector Ambrose to keep this quiet. Perhaps talk some sense into him, Carlington says. 
No, no, that's not how one does things, Mopsy says. You have to break into the police station and make a daring rescue. You ponder for a moment. I will go to the police station and try to talk some sense into Inspector Ambrose. I will help Valentine escape. We should do nothing and let justice run its course. Okay, so we're not going to do the bottom one because a wrong has happened here. Something bad has happened and we need to try and sort it out. So either we can go to the police station and try to talk some sense into him or we try and help her escape. Although I don't quite know how we're going to do that. How are we going to break into a police station and get her out? And then when she's out, what's going to happen then? What's going to happen? I don't know. But I think that's probably the more fun option. It's probably not the most practical option, but it's certainly the most fun option. So I think just, you know, for reasons of fun and, in you know, enhancing the story a bit more, let's try and help her escape. Let's break into a police station and make a daring rescue. Why the heck not? I will sneak into the Woodland Centre police station and try to find a way to break Valentine out of her unjust imprisonment, you say. Good, said Mopsy. That's right. Too dangerous, Carlington says, frowning. What if you are caught? It would be a further shame upon the house. He won't be, says Mopsy. Go, go now. <gasps> Two hours later. Okay, right, we're just making this more and more ridiculous. And so it comes to pass that you find yourself slinking through the first floor of the Woodland Centre police station. You had expected a rather difficult infiltration. When one says the words, break into the police station and break someone out of a jail cell, it sounds rather heroic. One imagines all manner of daring escapades and narrow escapes. And on a typical day, in a more typical police station, that might well be true. But the Woodland Centre Station is a rather sleepy small affair, without vigilant patrols or modern security features. Further, it seems that the whole of the police department is preparing for their entry in the Harvest Festival boat race and are eagerly discussing strategy and considering the competition. Okay, so the police force in this little sleepy police station are all doing something else. They are very distracted. At the moment, you are hiding in a storage closet, waiting for two officers to pass by. Unfortunately, they are having a detailed conversation and don't seem to be in any hurry to move along. You crouch behind a rack of old police uniforms and listen. Can we not put one on? Can we not wear a uniform? That would be good. This is our year, says a hoarse voice. We better win. If Firesnuff's team wins again, I'm going to lose my shirt. What I'm thinking, says the hoarse voice, and what I'm thinking is that we ought to try to row really hard. Like this. Let me show you my idea. Here, I'll sit on the floor and demonstrate using these rollers. That's good risk action. Try to put your back into it more, though. You cannot stay here in the closet forever. How are you going to rescue Valentine? I like the way they're doing <laughs> just sort of boat rowing demonstrations on the floor. Okay. Um, I tumble silently out of the closet, uh, closet, pause behind a file cabinet, and then when nobody's looking, I pickpocket the key from one of the officers. Okay, pickpocketing a key last time we tried that outside the mud wasp estate. That went kind of wrong, so let's not do that. I put on one of the police uniforms and walk right past them like I belong here. I walk out of the closet and pretend I'm a lost tourist who would like to see the jail cells. I think let's put on a uniform. And we can make something up. If they say, where are you from? We can say, we're from Scotland Yard or something. Let's put on a uniform. Because that's what I thought when it said we were near them all. I kind of thought that. So there we go. You find a police uniform that fits you smartly and you put on a helmet, adjusting the chin strap carefully. You also take a clipboard from a pile of them on the table. Then you stroll out. Good day, fellows, you say. They look up at you, surprised. Then one sees your badge and does a double take. Superintendent, he shouts, coming, oh no, <laughs> he shouts, coming to attention. I, I, I didn't know that we we're due for inspection, begging your pardon. The other officer looks confused, but comes to attention as well. Yes, I am here for inspection, you say, as you can clearly see from my clipboard. Your names? Uh, Sergeant Witherspoon, and this is Constable Wags. He's new, if you please. Witherspoon and Wags, eh, <laughs> you say. Yes, quite right. Let me find our storage closet acceptable. Hmm you say non-committally. You scrutinise the two anxious officers as they squirm before you. Okay, right, now the only thing is, we need to do this quick before Ambrose comes back, because he's going to see through this. He's not going to fall for this. He, he's going to see our face, and then it's all going to go horribly wrong. So your uniforms are dirty, 10 demerits for each of you. I just want to let you know that I'm very impressed by the both of you, very impressed. I have a sense that promotions may be on the way for both of you. Now it's the time for the key inspection. Let me see your keys, all of them. Okay. Now, that might be the best thing for us to do. If we're trying to get somebody out of a prison cell, having the key is certainly going to be helpful. These things here could be quite good. I mean, if we say that, yes, we're very impressed, that might give us a little bit of sway with them. They might be quite happy with us and they might be keen to impress us further to make sure they get promotions. Let's go for the keys. We'll go for the keys. 
Is that really a... Uh, starts Wags, but Witherspoon kicks him. You do not disobey the superintendent, he says, holding out his keys. After a minute, Wags does the same. You make a big show of examining all of their keys and praising the ones that are particularly shiny. You make some notes on your clipboard. In the process, palm a dull brass key labelled cells. Looks well enough, officers. You scored an 86 out of 100. Not bad. Room for improvement, of course. Shiny keys. That's the name of the game, isn't it? You may do what you please, but polish your keys, as my mother used to say. Mind you, said that too, says with a spoon ingratiatingly, as he replaces most of his keys on his belt, aside from the one you pocketed. Now, why don't you two run off and let me inspect this room without you underfoot? Go on, take an hour and practice your rowing outside. They run at double time out of the station. With them gone, you are quickly able to locate a spare set of keys, and you find the cells just down the hall. Why do you need a spare set of keys? Really got the key. And um, you take a moment to shed your police disguise and return to your typical outfit. A police disguise is useful, but the typical garb of a well-trained valet, I think you pronounce it valet, I think that's valet, isn't it? Valet is a much more is much more appropriate for day-to-day -day escapades. Yes, it is. You quickly locate Valentine in the lockup, who is hopping from one foot to the other and whistling. Cupboard, says Valentine. Oh, thank goodness, I was getting bored. I must have been there for an hour, maybe more. Come on, Valentine, let's get out of here. I was working on this dance called the Jailbird Shuffle. I have a feeling it's going to be a very big hit. Watch this. <sighs> Show me later, Valentine. All right, all right. Together, you and Valentine open a window in the hall and climb out of the police station. You leave the police station and Valentine shakes her head to clear the cobwebs. Ugh, that cell stank. So, Gertie Porpy, you ask. Suddenly, Valentine begins to cry. What do you do? So do you pat her uncomfortably, saying, there, 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 hook her, or just basically say, could you kindly stop crying? I don't appreciate you've been lying. Let's uncomfortably kind of go, there, 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 because, you know, I kind of think that's quite funny. Valentine ducks under your arm and hides her face in the uh, in the crook of your arm, uh, wiping a not insignificant amount of fluid onto your sleeve. Right, hang on. Why has she done that? Is she stealing something from our pockets or whatever? Oh, cupboard, Valentine cries. Oh, cupboard. Kindly be quieter, you say. There are people about. Specifically, there are two police officers following us. Valentine shudder sobs into your sleeve for a while longer while you try to extract yourself. I'm horrible. I'm the worst. There, there, you say. There, there. Finally, you manage to maintain some appropriate distance. I'm a terrible liar, Valentine says. Terrible. Tell me the truth, then. I'm American. I'm not from the Cotswolds at all. I think Inspector Ambrose covered that pretty clearly. You have an astonishingly good fake accent. I know, I've had an accent coach. I've worked on the stage for years and I'm trying to break into the movies. My real name is Gertie Porpy. What kind of acting have you done, you ask? In cabarets, mostly. Lately, I've been able to get some supporting roles in some very good stuff, though. I was in a Shaw play and some Shakespeare. Well, not exactly plays, more like revues, but I'm about to get my big break. I don't know what a revue is, but okay. I'm about to get my big break. Oh... I've got an audition coming up in Hollywood in a few weeks. It's the most swell part you ever saw. It's a romantic piece set in a big English country house like Ritornello. I have to play the perfect servant. That's why I thought of this brilliant idea, to come over here and learn the ropes. I earn my passage by singing and dancing on a cruise ship from New York, and I figure I can do the same heading back. But, but how do I come into it? Why did you attach yourself to me? I hung around the Cadbury Club in London and overheard a juicy rumour that you were being considered for something called the Inner Circle. I don't even really know what that is. I just figured it meant you knew what you were talking about and I could learn from you, that's all. Then I forged that letter. Valentine sobs again. Now do you hate me? I mean, in a way, I kind of, I kind of admire the, I admire the effort. It's quite an impressive scheme. Um, okay, I don't approve, but I'm glad it's out in the open. I can't be angry at you, Valentine. Nothing has changed. I forgive you, but in the future, why not keep you acting on the stage? I don't hate you at all. In fact, I'm impressed you were able to fool everybody. You are going to be famous someday. That's what I was just saying. I'm actually quite impressed that this whole thing worked and went on for as long as it did. I mean, she fooled us, sort of. We did have our suspicions. Yeah, that one. Let's go for that one. Um, I don't hate her at all. It, it's actually quite impressive. I have acting chops. That's what my drama coach back home tells me. Good society will highly disapprove of you. We acting types are sort of used to that. As long as you like me, I think everything will be all right. Oh, hang on. Oh, the next chapter's on the way. Oh my goodness. The Village Harvest Festival is beginning to get underway in town, and you and Valentine wend your way through town, heading for the riverside, where Aunt Primrose's household will be gathered in preparation for boat race and other events. The town is festooned in banners, and it seems the whole of the Woodland Centre is swelling the streets. Street vendors beckon you with hot spice cider and caramel dipped apples. The strains of an umpa band waft joyfully forth from a bandstand. You buy a large straw hat for Valentine from a vendor. 
which serves as a perfectly acceptable disguise so she is not recaptured during the festival. Can we not just send her away somewhere? It's a little bit dangerous to have her wandering about, isn't it? This is amazing, says Valentine. I love this, especially the big yellow flower on it. It is meant for an emergency disguise, not for aesthetics, but I'm glad it amuses you. Right, hang on, hang on. Do we need to remember this big yellow flower? Is that going to come up? Is there going to be a bit where we lose her? I'm just trying to predict how this game works and what we're seeing so far. Is there going to be a bit where we lose her and then we're going to look around and there's going to be loads of people wearing large straw hats and there's going to be one with a yellow flower and a blue flower and a red flower and a whatever, an orange flower or something. And we have to pick the right person because why would why would that be mentioned otherwise? I'm suspicious of you now, game. I think we need to remember that. Okay, big yellow flower. Okay, right, try and commit that to memory. Although, you know, I'll probably go to sleep before I record the next one of these, so I'll probably forget. But okay, try and remember big yellow flower. Um, you gaze up at the sky. It is clear and bright. To all appearances, a joyful and light day. But you know better. All in all, the whole atmosphere begins to look suspiciously like the setting for a highly exciting and altogether thrill-filled narrative climax. I imagine it absolutely does. And chapter eight is, of course, called The Harvest Festival. And I think that might be, that's the last proper chapter, I'm fairly sure. I think I read on the Steam Store page that there are eight chapters, and I think there's like an epilogue type thing. So I think next time we might see the end of Tally Ho, but oh my goodness me, it is all building up to some sort of hugely farcical finale, isn't it? So uh, yeah, the arrangement between uh, Rory and Frankincense is off. We've kind of, you know, we've broken someone out of, I was going to say prison, a jail, a prison cell, a cell in the police station. So, you know, we've just got that sorted. Um, we had to deal with some random peacocks, but they've been dealt with. We've been given some sort of weird herbal drug things <laughs> to enhance our rowers. Um, and now we're here waiting for the Harvest Festival to begin and all sorts of nonsense is going to happen. Oh, and of course, uh, Rory wants to go with us to New York, which sounds marvellous as well. So lots going on next time. I'm sure it's going to be very, very silly. The finale, I imagine, of Tally Ho will be next week. But uh, yeah, we need to finish up for now. But yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be wonderful next week. It's going to be all sorts of silly. There's going to be a lot of very daft things happening. And I am looking forward to it immensely. Hopefully you have enjoyed this. If you have, please do leave a like. That would be most splendid indeed. And also, if you're not already, then please do subscribe to keep up to date with how we get on here next time out in Tally Ho. But for now, thank you very much for joining me in the Geek Cupboard. And I will see you next time. This is going to end badly. This is going to end badly, I suspect. <laughs> My God, it's Pengu. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have to put the engine bit. I feel that might be a problem in making a car. I've broken the windscreen. It's, end, it's ending badly. It's ending very badly indeed. I might crash into a tree. How do I do any of the stuff with this car?